sometimes we end up you know just uh, looking over with our rose tinted glasses you know about what yeah. we genuinely good at versus what we are told we good at so i think it would definitely be this that you know just got you've got to follow your heart you've got to follow your gut and you've got to then pursue those um those interests which would have still let me continue the marketing they wanted to basically understand can we have a better shade of blue which will increase our roi on google ads and then they found that when they did change it they made an additional 200 million dollars there's a corner of death in every creative in every ad and that's the bottom right so in your ad you should never have your logo mm-hmm. ever there in the bottom right because that's the area that people will see the last so attention by then has like exhausted so they're not going to really so you can have it anywhere you can have it in the middle is the best because what happens is you're scanning we scan it and then we go from up to bottom like top to bottom so having it in the middle mm-hmm. makes sense both makes sense do you think every purchase you make is a conscious decision i was able to answer that question for myself after my conversation on neuromarketing with none other than dia singh who is a ceo and founder of neurohook a neuromarketing agency stay tuned for my conversation with dia singh as an expert can you explain us what neuromarketing is Yes, absolutely. But before I explain for the rest of the podcast, I'm not an expert. I'm I'm always going to be a lifelong learner. And even in neuromarketing, if you do meet experts, it's quite rare. So everyone in the space of neuromarketing is a learner. And what neuromarketing is all about from a very student's point of view is it's understanding why your customers do what they do and trying to understand the psychology behind it. It's not the brain, it's the psychology behind people. about people's intentions and that is neuromarketing. Do you want to share a little about your business that you recently started? Yes. It's been 2 years. Yes. And it's being really successful and must say <laughs> I must congratulate you as well. Thank You're you. doing a great mm-hmm. job there. <laughs> Thanks so much. Tell us more about that. Yeah. So neurohook is basically hook your customers with neuromarketing. Simple. And what we do is we take neuromarketing peer reviewed researched content and apply it into our customers and clients social media marketing efforts or branding efforts because these are the only two services we provide we are a very niche based agency and everything we plan is based on a lot of research so well thought of plan and it's backed by a couple of neuroscientists that we have on board who mm-hmm. validate the information and make it from a peer review to an expert review from a neuroscientific point of view which obviously as a marketer is not something that comes natural to me because you've got to be an expert in neuroscience. So if anyone says that they're an expert in neuromarketing, mm-hmm. what they really are trying to say is that we are an expert in neuroscience. Okay. Yeah, marketing is the still analysis like, part of it. Yes, uh yeah, 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 but like getting to the technical aspect of like actually recording the content, actually analyzing the con- the way your brain works when mm-hmm. you are exposed to certain stimuli. So that is the scientific way of you know decoding the subject and that is neuroscience nice yeah what would you say are the key elements in neuro neuromarketing and neuroscience so when it comes to elements or defining elements of neuromarketing it is still a very broad question mm-hmm. um to it, it will always tailor to the kind of brand that is using neuromarketing and what their goals are and then those elements change the baseline of it is emotion is using emotional marketing it's using it's truly understanding the heart and not just the head of your customer right. and when you truly keep the customer at the heart of everything you do then your content is also like very versatile and rich mm-hmm. so emotions is one element of mm-hmm. consistent element of neuromarketing understanding to understand emotion you need certain elements like attention let me so, let again, me simply simplify, simplify my question that I asked you by by elements I meant the process of mm-hmm. your strategy making building the strategy right. for a brand mm-hmm. what would be the key elements for you first just understanding the customer and mm-hmm. whenever we take any client on board we spend maximum time in just understanding who they are targeting why they've done what they've done till now but also understanding from the customer's point of view about keeping all the options of their like you know competitors open and stuff so our process always starts with a very customer centric driven 
data analysis. Right. And then we get to the neuromarketing aspect for the brand, whether it, it need not then be customer centric. It's just, you know, what your competitors in, say, Denmark are doing and how they have utilized neuromarketing. And could you probably do the same? And this is the kind of information we have on board, peer reviewed research papers, analysis. And this is what neuroscience has got to say. And then we dumb it down for them. Ki, you know, how do we simplify it for you to actually use it? So we're not in in uh, the neuromarketing space from the technical point of view, for at least for now. Don't know about the future. We'll mm -hmm. not like expose any of those future plans. But the point is this, that yeah, research-driven content. So our entire journey always begins there. And of course, if the service is grinding, then you want to, do you want to get into that golden circle of marketing where you like to believe, where you like to think about why you believe in a certain brand right. and what you kind of want to do for them. And then that's where the strategy comes in. And it's just digital marketing, basically. But your root stays neuromarketing, and that's the process we have. So we are a very process-driven boutique agency. We, nice. don't, we don't take just anyone and everyone. And we take people who we genuinely feel we can add value. If I don't have information on a certain industry about neuromarketing, I'm not going to like just cash on it because, yeah. you know, again, I have a first movers advantage. That I don't want to do that. Well done, well done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. Um, so uh, neuromarketing is mm -hmm. fairly a new term that's been into come to studies, right? Can you tell us the timeline of where and when did it first initiated, like as a study? Relatively, it's it's been a it's been a topic of hype in the marketing world. Everyone has been very intrigued by it. But let me convert it into a story. 20, 30 years ago, a lot of neuromarketing agencies were introduced in the West. And what happened is that they promised the world to the clients. So you're like, you will know what your customer is thinking. We can, we know what that, what the desires are, what the needs are. And you know, this is what we're going to do. So they promised way too much, way too soon. So that's when this, you know, the spiraling of the ethical side of neuromarketing, which I think should exist, started. So then there was like a downfall in the subject because there is no way to measure it. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're not we're not there if even technologically at that standard where we can kind of create those rules and guidelines about using neuromarketing. So that's been the story of neuromarketing. But in the last you know few years, there has been a lot more buzz because especially in the field of marketing, everyone wants to know what's next. So you know, digital marketing has been that answer for mm -hmm. a couple of decades now. But especially with the advent of I mean, with the, with COVID. Mm -hmm. you know, it just it bloomed even right. more. So now it's neuromarketing that's blooming, that's on the bloom. The bud is there in the garden of marketing, mm -hmm. the, the world of marketing. And now how we nurture it and kind of make that, you know, flower bloom into a fruit. I think that's going to take a few years. But that's the story of neuromarketing. If I, if I can just like simplify it and also beautify it. You spoke about technology. Mm -hmm. How does neuromarketing, like how do you use AI in neuromarketing at the moment? Are you using enough AI? AI tools? Uh, we're using AI tools in every industry. So in neuromarketing, um, I'll be very honest, I'm not using it for neuromarketing, but I'm using it for marketing. No, and it could be easy for you to, you know, decipher the, 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 the data numbers that you get in mm -hmm. deciding what kind of strategy to implement. Hmm. So the numbers would be easier to be, you know, by AI trying to analyze it mm -hmm. than the human with less, you know, problems. Dependency. In, yes. That is a very interesting point. And that is something which I've kind of been very involved in. Mm -hmm. That how can you get from a technical point of view? But the, 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 the spice of the answer is this, that it's not just AI, there's also machine learning. Yeah. So for you to kind of get, a, you know, technology which truly... Um, surpasses uh, or like you know surpasses the human error mm -hmm. that's got to be with machine learning and AI the combination of that and uh, yeah Neuro will be uh, will be an agency that that's involved in a process like this very soon so yeah but I'll are have people answers. are people currently using AI for their neuromarketing and people are barely using neuromarketing so for them to it? take for them to take a step uh, into AI and neuromarketing that's that's very bleak. It's but I feel happening. the corporations have got the budget yes. for marketing, big mm -hmm. budgets for marketing, lo mm -hmm. loads of corporations, mm -hmm. be it branding, be it F&B. 
they have a lot of budget for marketing yeah. and i'm sure that a lot of budget from there is in neuromarketing as well because oh, yeah. those are the people who are using it actually using yeah. it yeah yeah do you have any one case study that you really like about any brand that's doing brilliant neuromarketing i'll divide free to lay into two which is uh, you've got your lays so there was like a specific brand study on lays uh i make it interesting and i'll say the spice girls paradox mm -hmm. and it's also called as a cheerleader conspiracy could get into that and third is uh, is Pepsi Cola like a, I'm just giving a little bit of versatile options like you can do like a, a Pepsi versus Cola in terms of neuromarketing and where they stand. Mm -hmm. And I'll give another one just because I'm really interested is Pampers and the power of cuteness. Mm -hmm. So that's also interesting. A, so I'll give me four very I can give mm. you five honestly I can give you the give fifth me another one, one as well. Give me another one. Uh, okay 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 okay. I'm not like really thought and like I'm, I'm not sitting here with like a laid out plan uh, um, can i guess one for you like an apple maybe uh, apple as a brand yeah but they're not really using they've anyway simplified the brand from the from the get-go so the the brands that are using now want to get to that level where they're okay, simplifying fair, it fair, and fair. that's what they're using but i'll say uh, a prank done by cheetos i saw a that prank i yeah. did see that you did see it i did yeah, see that isn't it interesting yeah but the viewers probably haven't, so you could probably keep that on the table as well. True, true. But I know which one I'm going for. Okay. I'm going for Pepsi versus Cola. Pepsi versus Cola. Okay. Uh, all right. That's very interesting. And I'll give, I'll, I'll make it a little interactive for anyone who's tuning in. Um, if there are two vending machines, there's mm -hmm. a Pepsi vending machine, there's a Cola vending, uh, vending machine. Which one do you think users or like even just like consumers would go more to? You have like three seconds to think about it. A quick answer. I think cola. Cola? But you know what the right answer is? Is the it? real answer. Is it Pepsi? No. It's actually 50-50. Because what happens is, when you just have Pepsi vending machine there, or a cola vending machine there, you are thinking that my option is, I just have cola. So I, I, I can only choose Coke. But if you have Pepsi and Coke, you're like, should I choose Pepsi or should mm -hmm. I choose Coke? Whereas if it was just one vending machine, you're like, should I just have water, be a little health conscious, or should I have Coke? So that's the difference. Yeah. So then it actually ends up being Pepsi versus Coke. And the neuromarketing study, and I'll again try to make it as um, narrative as possible, is that everyone likes to associate themselves with taste, the happiness, and the kind of campaigns that Coke has had. You know, and we're it becomes almost like a a great party kickstarter conversation like that to break that ice where people are like what's your poison like in terms of you know a beverage and they're like oh you know we're a thumbs up mm -hmm. person or oh, i'm a coke person or i'm a pepsi person so what these guys want to understand is that which one do people actually prefer in terms of you know a brand from a brand preference point of view mm -hmm. and what about the taste which one is actually good when it comes to the taste and the it turned out that everyone loved being associated with, with someone who drinks Coke. Coca-Cola is a mm -hmm. brand. Mm -hmm. But the taste, they chose Pepsi. Is it? Yeah. And it's a very, it's very, uh, everyone is aware of this. It's a very mm -hmm. popular neuromarketing case study, Pepsi versus Coke. But if there's no cola, I wouldn't, wouldn't mind getting Pepsi. If there's no well, cola. I'll get a thumbs up. <laughs> there we have a thumbs up there. That's competing or, you know, like maybe a Fanta. So that's a very interesting case study. Is there any other case study that you'd probably found interesting? Any other case study other than five you told yeah, me? Yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, the powder one? The, the kids power powder? Power of cuteness. Kids powder? Yes, the power of cuteness. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, it's basically that a lot of brands and you'll see the most random brands like companies and insurance are using dogs in there uh, as a random post, which has got nothing to do with dog insurance. Yeah. So why are they using dogs? Why are they, why are random companies that have got nothing to do with babies and they're promoting cute baby pictures? Mm. Because the thing is, if they want to make their content memorable. And like one of the first few questions you ask is, what are the elements of new marketing? And it is attention mm -hmm. and emotion. So that's what they want to, you know, retain. And bring out the best way to retain someone's attention is show them a picture of a really cute dog and a baby. Bring and out some emotions out of yeah, them. Yeah, so if you can get babies and puppies in your grid or in your, you know, content piece, then that's uh, that could be very interesting. But then how you do so, that's where neuromarketing comes in and that's where 
our research comes in. So, for mm-hmm. example, if your baby or puppy is just pacing, you know, it's a front face shot in the advertisement. So then there is no brand connection. They're looking at the baby, puppy, and then they're scrolling to the other post. Yeah. But if the baby or the dog or the puppy, whatever, is looking at a marketing message on, you know, on one side or the logo on the left side, then you're looking at the cute creature <laughs> looking at the branding element or the marketing element. And then they create a brand, you know, um, connect the dots. And we're constantly connecting the dots. So that ad has got to be a lot more um, engaging. It's going to hold your yes. attention. And that is also what we do. We, we get new to marketing research and we're mm-hmm. like, okay, we're going to use the power of cuteness and we're going to do it by doing this, 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 because here's what the research has got to say. And you can look at the pros and cons of, you know, these kind of ads. So, yeah. Yeah, because when, when the emotions come out, yeah. we don't realize it, but in our subconscious, mm-hmm. we are feeding our mind that this is, this is where I felt good emotions and yeah. I want to feel it again. And yeah. how will I feel that again? By, you know, getting a part of the brand that they see, mm-hmm. right? So a lot of the emotions are also stuck in your subconscious and that's why you believe what you believe and see what you see and like what you like as well. Yeah, and it's 100% of that. Like what you said stands true to the ground here, for sure. Yeah. I consider myself like a conscious consumer. Yes, you are. Okay, I, yeah. I believe I, I try you to are. be. You are. I try to be. Yeah. But the lot of times I mm-hmm. fall in some marketing scam not scams but marketing gimmicks mm-hmm. as well mm-hmm. i would uh, mm-hmm. is that because of neuromarketing <laughs> that's, that's a very interesting question and uh, i get this question a lot where people always question the ethics and they think that neuromarketing is a field that's going to manipulate it's going to invade your privacy and it's going to get in your brain and that's the main question but here's the answer neuromarketing is all about understanding the psyche the way your mind works, of, right. of your consumer behavior. It's getting into your behavior and not in your brain as such. So that that needs to, of course, be, that's a misconception. But I'll tell you, there's also truth to it. And what, what I mean by truth is, since it's a very new industry and to get the technical aspects, you do have to, you have to get those insights from people. So a lot of times people feel like it's, they're in, in your marketing, the subject is invading their mm-hmm. privacy and a lot of times people don't want to be aware of what they actually think about some things we want to live in denial and it's okay no judgments here but you don't want to know that okay you know I've, I've believed in this brand for so long but actually it's the other brand that I kind of resonate more with or mm-hmm. I like something that I'm not supposed to like like for example the Cheetos ad that prank was mainly this that you know users were shown this ad where a woman was uh, washing her clothes and the other woman put a bag of Cheetos in there and it was a prank that the the sample size didn't like they didn't like the ad they're like we don't like this ad because it's, it's mean yeah it's but pointless the, the the technical aspect the when they were actually saying this and it was being measured said that they actually really enjoy the ad people so, like resonate with negativity as well that's what I feel that is true they are more interested in negativity than positivity yeah and people don't want to be aware of it so in that way, having strict, uh, like having a guideline mm-hmm. of how to use a subject is so crucial. And tell me, which industry doesn't have a guideline of, you know, using it, you, you know, to kind of not get into the to the, to the dark side. Of yeah. it. Every industry has it. But neuromarketing visits, because it's something that terrifies people. It's too new. They've been, their trust has been broken once when, you know, agencies came years ago and they're like, we'll promise you the world. Yeah. We'll do this for you. The, your customer will be like an open book and you can flip through your customer and know everything about them. And when those promises were not met, there's like this very dark uh, presence about right. from the from, from manipulation, from the ethics point the of view. The privacy point of view. From well. the privacy point of view, from the data protection point of view, which needs to be answered. And, it, and also, you've got to be really honest if you're in the industry that, yes, there are dark sides of it in terms of making sure that you just follow a, you know, a guideline. Yeah. Another win of the Cheetos ad could also be yeah. that um, the fact that people remember something that they don't like as well. Right? Mm-hmm. But you still remember it's like a marketing. They're, they're, yeah. they're putting themselves yeah. out there to yep. people to know more. Yeah. Yeah. Che- they remember Cheetos by something negative, but they still have that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's a win on that ad also. For sure. If not on the other an- angle. For sure. Sometimes 
Uh, see, I'll, I'll again, I'll introduce another, uh, maybe like a controversial conversation here. But Facebook wants you to feel two emotions. And it's anger and frustration. They want you to be angry sure, and frustrated sure. on Facebook. And the reason being is when you're angry or frustrated, you want to you want Express. to cradle, you know, but you want to cradle your insecurities. You want to get products that don't make you feel that way. And then you'll shop more on the app. And then the app will send you ads like that. So that's what Facebook does. And that's why Facebook is always battled with protection laws. Because are they truly protecting their customers? Because this doesn't seem like protecting to me and like I don't use Facebook of course I use it for my clients mm -hmm. and I have to keep myself aware of what happens in the platform but as a user it, it's a negative platform and guess which social media platform is the happiest platform Instagram no is it not at all happiest as in happiest like users are happy to use this platform is it LinkedIn no Snapchat Snapchat yeah that's true that yeah, actually is true yeah, yeah yeah because suddenly you don't you share only what you want to share mm -hmm. with a very specific person. You can put stories, but mm -hmm. you're mainly sharing content to, you know, like you're creating those streaks. And uh, so yeah, so Snapchat is a very, very private space where you actually probably respect your social boundaries a lot more than Instagram, where, okay, we have the close friends feature, but okay, how many people use it? And of course, if you're putting something out there, it's, it's there for all your followers, private, public, whatever. So it's not really a positive platform as such, right. but how it makes you feel. That's what social media does to you, right? It wants you it to re retain your attention. We are not customers. We are, we are serving them basically <laughs> by, by be, you know, being on social media throughout. Mm -hmm. We are serving them, get more money through their advertisements. You just being social on social media. What you'll probably do in a party, meet like 50 people. You're just doing that quickly on social media. You're, it's a platform to be social. It's a platform where community building can thrive and of course of course it's very similar to substance abuse because obviously it makes you release certain uh, you know uh, hormones and it makes you feel in a certain way so you've got to be conscious about any industry like if of course if you that smoke a lot if, or if you drink a lot you have to be aware that you know you're doing certain thing and you've got to have like clear boundaries about it you've got to know your consequences the same way you're spending time digitally got to know the consequences, whether it's a physical consequence of, of a weak eyesight and you don't mm -hmm. want to just constantly be glued to a screen, or whether it's something which is a lot more philosophical or intense, where you just talk about, is it worth my time? Or am I just whiling away? Or like, am I learning something? Instead? But do you, does people fall for it? Do they, they do fall for it? Of course. I mean, but again, it's not what you're talking about. You, what, yeah, what you're talking about is a perfect scenario yeah. where people don't feel emotions and they won't go for more dopamine online. Yeah, but they do. But majority of us yes, do. Of course, we yeah. all do. We all do. So that's what they're trying to retain our attention just yeah. for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But not, not every, see, it depends on the brand. It depends on your marketing message. You're not going to always have sad marketing messages you have to always ask what kind of emotion you want your customers to feel so if you see around the festive campaigns most brands take that a very used to take a very negative approach to emotions mm -hmm. but if you see now those ads have changed the kind of language has changed they don't want you to feel positive through an, a negative route but they want you to feel positive through a through a positive route cool. but it's it's a lot it's emotional and it's a lot more emotional because it's somewhere that that positive feeling when you break that down it's it's words like aspiration inspiration empowerment stuff like that so that too is so closely linked to you know neuromarketing leveraging emotional marketing understanding yeah. that you're talking to people you're not talking to a robot you can't have like a very robotic communication you cannot have a robotic language mm -hmm. and go and make mistakes Absolutely. As a person, and I'll, I'll give you a very interesting study. Wendy's mm -hmm. used to have uh, have like the a very typical online response strategy. So if anyone would give a query or a comment, they would have like, oh, you know, how can we help you? And then the CEO changed the the dynamics of the mm -hmm. corporate culture. And he's like, you know what? From now onwards, you, this specific person, will handle Twitter now X. You don't have to take approvals from anyone, from the marketing manager. Uh -uh, go ahead, do whatever you want to do. And go roast, be yourself. That person changed the ball game, changed the ball game completely. And now Wendy roasts customers, Wendy roasts McDonald's. So it's, so that kind of stuff also comes under, you know, emotional marketing. Right. Do you want people to laugh at your content? And humor is one of the, 
a most difficult emotion to kind of evoke from people because there is no one genetic joke that makes people laugh. But till what, what's the maximum length you can take your marketing message with an emotion that's also neuromarketing. That's true. Yeah. Would you say neuromarketing is a foolproof marketing campaign? Like it's like a short, short way of getting customers and sales. That's the main mm. agenda. Do you think that's the case? One would think the answer to be maybe a yes, but it's really not because you are analyzing based on consumer behavior. And behavior changes. We're constantly changing. Our habits, you know, shape our behavior so that your data will not stay relevant for too long. That's the, the magic behind the work then, that, you know, how relevant is your data? Because behavior has changed by the time you probably read the article out there. Right. There's a corner of death in every creative, in every ad, and that's the bottom right. So in your ad, you should never have your logo mm -hmm. ever there in the bottom right. Because that's the, the area that people will see the last. So attention by then has like exhausted. So they're not going to relate. So you can have it anywhere. You can have it in the middle is the best because what happens is you're scanning. We scan everything and then we go from up to bottom, like top to bottom. So having it in the middle mm -hmm. makes sense. Bottom makes sense. And in fact, you can uh, Google uh, a lot of ads and now see a lot of new, uh, newspaper ads. And they'll have it always on the bottom right. They've been called out for it, like neuroscientists go ahead yeah. and they're like, what are you guys doing? You know, it's all incorrect, but like everyone does not believe neuromarketing. And that's okay. We, people will get there eventually. They Just like how they did for digital marketing. True. Why, why spend so much money on digital? Our product will sell offline. Let's focus on banner ads. Let's focus on pamphlets. Mm -hmm. And then, bam, COVID. Everyone's there on digital. Yeah. And now... Like someone like me who used to not shop digit like online is now like just before the podcast, I got a notification and a call for an OTP for an online sale that I made. There'll come a day when people will when marketers will rely so much on neuromarketing insight. And maybe that day is already here. I'm sure it's here, of course. Yeah. I'm not the only one here. <laughs> I, believe so I believe in it. I believe in it. Yeah. 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 So at New Hook, do you, do you want to share with our with us your brands that you work with? Uh, no, I won't do that. But no? I'll give you categories. I'll give you uh, names. So a very interesting one for me has been in it is he's in the they the brand is in a cannabis medicine space. So here everything, not just I don't neuromarketing is a subject we're yet to explore thoroughly. But even understanding the brand from a marketing point of view has been so interesting because there are so many obstacles when it comes to like marketing for a cannabis brand. And this brand truly is one of the best in the market. And I'm talking about from a global market point of view. Like they believe in science. They believe every every aspect of the brand starts from like from, from science. And it's so interesting for me because I like to believe that when science meets marketing, you meet us, Neuro, Neuro oh, yeah. So it's a brand that I have a lot of fun with because even the team believes in, you know, getting all the information through science and we literally do the same. So that's been really interesting. And we have, fortunately, we've had like great clients in real estate industry, which has been really fun. We have an education sector. I'll tell you a sector that we don't work, we don't cater is uh, F&B. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's also- been What about nice. publishing? Uh, publishing. Oh, How can you use uh, neuromarketing publishing? The book is indeed judged by the cover. So you will need to apply neuromarketing in packaging, in packaging the book and how it looks. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, there's so many interesting case studies also about what kind of font to use. And sometimes the entire ball game can change if the font is different. Even the so color of the book for that matter? Color of the book, because then you've got psychology behind all the colors. So like yellow will make you feel creative. Green will make you feel safe. It'll make you feel like it's healthy or like it's a positive color. That's why hospital color, hospital uh, curtains used to be green. Mm -hmm. That's the main you know, thing. Red will make you feel powerful, will make you feel love, will make you feel danger, will make you feel stuff like power. So, you know, you've got all sorts of association. So sometimes, yeah, you can talk about what the subject really is in terms of, you know, the, the book and what kind of colors you think would associate the best with it. 
and uh, yeah, yeah. What is the strongest color for you in neuromarketing? Uh, that has to be one. I don't want to say there's one because I've done a lot of branding projects where I've suggested different colors, and Fair. it truly depends, right? There is no one. There's no one answer that fits the bill. Can I tell you my answer yes. and tell me what you think about that answer? Go is ahead. it blue? Oh my god! I'm so glad you said blue because I can share so much information about blue with a case study. And your hook is blue, and the reason we're blue is because it's a color that makes you feel very safe, secure, and it's the easiest color to trust. Yeah, it's, it's trustworthy. Easiest color to trust. So that's why we're blue and. Uh, Google actually had this shades, 50 shades of blue experiment. Mm -hmm. in, in truth, it was actually 200, like 200,000 shades of blue. <laughs> I'm exaggerating my answer, but there were like thousands mm -hmm. shades of blue. And they chose, uh, they wanted to basically understand, can we have a better shade of blue, which will increase our ROI on Google Ads. And then they found that when they did change it, they made an additional two hundred million dollars additional 200 million dollars because it changed the color uh, the shade of blue for the google ads which made people click on the ads quicker and yep so that's the psychology there's the power of psychology that's knowing neuromarketing and yeah. you can do it any brand can do it of course you've got to do like a b c d e f g testings and all on it but Again, new marketing is all about experimenting what works and what doesn't. And tell me again, which industry isn't? Don't experiment with food all the time. So why won't you like to experiment with your marketing efforts? Why do you want to go lull? New marketing allows you to not go lull, to constantly explore and also make mistakes and be okay with uh, with figuring out what your brand is all about. And that's something I truly believe in. That mm -hmm. don't consider your brand like right now when I was talking about the, my my client, I said he because in my head the way we've personified the brand it's a he for some of our brands it's a she so always personify your brands mm. don't think of you know your brand as like as a man or uh, as, as a brand as a robot yeah. like as a man or a woman what kind of traits would he or she have yes. you know what kind of emotions what's his or her online behavior True. you know stuff like that what what does the brand truly really believe in like i wanted to do the same exercise with neurohook mm -hmm. and i wanted to be associated with with things that the brand would be passionate about. And of course, I individually am very passionate about dogs. And um, it just so happened that every team member that we have on board is so passionate about dogs. So now we've started publishing content on our Instagram uh, with dogs. And we've associated ourselves also with like an NGO where we do pro bono work for them. And it's called Save wow. the Stray if you're interested. You know, go ahead, donate Amazing. a little bit of money or whatever, and do your bit. but my brand believes in, you know, in taking care of dogs. Well. My brand believes in being a brand that people can trust. And hence the color blue really made the cut. So there's no favorite color as such. There are some brands who are pink and which, which are pink and it's mm -hmm. perfectly fine and it's beautiful. And I would not see that brand in any other way. Your blue just would not work. So there's no one cut answer that fits the bill. And that is also the most exciting thing about true, marketing. True, because it keeps suddenly, changing, right? Again. Yeah. Yeah, but suddenly you're, you ha you're creating personalized plans for all your customers, for all your clients. And uh, what is neuromarketing if not personalizing based on consumer behavior? Yeah, And true. sometimes that consumer behavior translates to brand behavior. So I'm going to ask you a personal question now that I ask all my guests. Mm -hmm. Number one, that is, which is one book that you would have wished you would have read earlier? It, does it have to be neuromarketing centric? Whatever you think would has helped you become what you are today? Oh my God. It's a very personal answer since it's a personal question. <laughs> but Grit. Grit. The book Grit. And you can literally just, just type the book Grit and you'll have like the, the book comments. It's one of the best sellers. But I think it was a very interesting one. And the way I relate, I would relate it a little bit to the subject is that since it's a very new industry, we've got a lot of people who are really against the idea of exploring your marketing. So sometimes you end up feeling that, are you on the right boat? Like, is it going somewhere? And sometimes you need that grit to, you know, go out there and change the market, change the industry, you know, to change the ball game completely. And that's what the book Grit tells you, that you will have adversities thrown at you. You will have obstacles. You'll have to crawl near them. You'll have to jump over them or you'll have to run into them and then get out. But 
what gets you out is grit. So in my industry, since it's such a new one and I'm new to it, I'm constantly, I have to use my grit to kind of really help neuromarketing get there for India. And I'm not, I don't have glo- a global vision yet. But I have a very national vision. So the book grit definitely resonates with me. And it, and it resonates in every aspect of my life. So that's nice. a book that you need to read. And the best part of it is that it's not, it's self-help book. So it's going to make you, you can relate it to anything. Grit for anything. Yeah. I'm going to add that to my list. You know, you should. It's, it's beautiful. Nice. And great cover. Great cover? It's blue. Okay. So I trust it. I trust that they will make me feel gritty once I've read the book. For sure. So check it out. And it's got a yellow font. Yellow, yellow and black over, uh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay. What's the second question is going to be, what's the advice you would give to your younger self? To my younger self? Yeah. One advice. <sighs> Very interesting. Oh my God. What if I, I mean, you were still wise when you were younger, mm. but again too young to give any advice to myself i've always been like i've always been very interested in psychology but it took me a very long time to really recognize that so i think as a kid if i could give a very specific advice it would be this to kind of tune in more with with what comes very natural to you Mm -hmm. because if i probably was a lot more tuned into it i would have probably studied that and maybe now while while you were introducing you said expert maybe i would have been an expert if I had tuned into what came very natural to me. Sometimes we end up, you know, just uh, looking over with our rose tinted glasses, you know, about what yeah. we're genuinely good at versus what we are, we're told we're good at. So I think it would definitely be this, that, you know, just got to, you've got to follow your heart. You've got to follow your gut. And you've got to then pursue those, um, those interests, which would have still led me to neuromarketing. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to end this conversation yes. with... Um, a question for you. Mm-hmm. Another one. I'm going to... Sorry? Another one. Is it personal? No, it's, I'm going gonna, gonna to put you on the spot. Mm-hmm. You, you, I had a lovely interaction with you. There's, I really appreciate you for that. Mm-hmm. How would you... What kind of title would you give this conversation for YouTube? Keeping neuromarketing in, in mind. Oh, okay. Like it's a catchphrase or something that would maybe get the audience's, you know, mm-hmm. attention for, for more. Mm-hmm. Um, see, since we've spoken a lot about the different, you know, ABCs of, of neuromarketing, I would probably say the PUPs and Qs of neuromarketing with you for sure. It could also be, uh, you know, there's like, you put, you truly have put me on a spot and I'll probably not be able to come up with the best, you know, answers no here. Pressure. So don't judge me. No pressure. Yeah. But give me one day my research dekha ke ki that this is the answer you need Done. to have. And I'll add that in that my yeah, YouTube video as well. Yeah. But you know, it is definitely you've unraveled the subject. True. So it could also be unraveling, you know, a neuromarketing. We definitely would use. We spoke about a lot, lot of positives. That was nice. That we, yeah, we yeah. focus on the good part of it. Focus on the negatives, but from a very honest point of view. True. True. Which is fun. Amazing, Dia. Yeah, wow. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Yeah, thank this you. This was beautiful. I had yeah. a lovely interaction with you. Yeah, and I'm, I'm you. sure the audience is going to get a lot of fruit from that as well. Yeah. Thank you. Loved your questions. So many personal Cheers. questions. Yeah. <laughs> if you enjoyed the episode, make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Until then, keep reimagining yourself and know that the power of change lies within you.